All right, Tony. Well, I am ready if you are, sir. Absolutely. Let's, let's go for it. Perfect. Well, welcome to 13 Questions, Tony. Um, should be a fun one. I assume that you've uh, had a chance to glance over the questions before, uh, before tonight. Yeah, I, I did actually. Yeah, I, I didn't want to turn up and not and get, get some nasty surprises. So, uh, yeah, I did take some time out to think critically about what answers I was going to give you. Awesome. Well, let's jump right in then. Question one. What was the best advice ever given to you? And would you modify it at all today? Um, so the best advice that I ever heard was um, the quote, caring about what people think about you is the biggest prison that you can live in. And for me, that really struck a chord because I think many people uh, go through their lives and uh, just it really keeps them in like this mental bondage, uh, people trying to impress other people, um, you know, sticking to like societal constructs. And I think a lot of people spend their entire lives just in that mental prison of, you know, not truly expressing who they really are. Um, and they're, you know, their kind of true soul essence because they're scared of what maybe their mom, their, their wife, their, friends, their neighbours might think of them. And when I first heard that quote, it, it was it struck me on such a deep level because I think at the time I probably did have some of that going on, as most of us do. And um, it really kind of helped me break free mentally of, of that mental construct and really start to I express my true, uh, my true nature and really not holding back on what I wanted to say and, and really becoming... Um, the version of me that I feel that I was meant to be. And uh, so I wouldn't actually change that, but that would be the best kind of, you know, quote that I, I, I've has, has had the biggest impact on me. I love yeah, that. I think, yeah. I think that it's, you know, it's absolutely true. A lot of people like to say that, Oh, I don't care about what other people think about me. Like I don't care about other people's opinions, but I think really a lot of us have, you know, that problem of, you know, acting in certain ways to avoid judgments from other people. So I think, yeah, I think it's an awesome answer. Well, it starts in school as well, doesn't it? You know, school's quite um, a hardcore environment. You know, there's uh, a lot of kids there that maybe they've got problems with their parents and, you know, they can turn to bullying and stuff. And then you've got to make sure you've got the right uh, trainers on. Otherwise, if they're not Nike, then... So from 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 really young age, we're we're kind of trained to to really care what people think. So, yeah, it is a powerful statement that, and and one that I've tried to break free from. Yeah, absolutely. If you keep living in other people's minds, then you're never living in your own. So, yeah, it's beautiful, exactly. man. I love it. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So uh, the next question. Yes, absolutely. What was the most important lesson you learned from your parents? Um, the important, uh, the most important lesson I learned from my parents, I think, came from um, certainly my dad, where he was perhaps a little bit more restricted when he was growing up in the fact that um, he was kind of um, made to do things and made to do jobs that perhaps uh, he didn't want to do. And... Um, you know, it was more about what his parents wanted him to do. And so uh, he grew up being, um, you know, quite agitated by that. And it was a big bugbear of his. And I think he decided that if and when he ever had children, that he would always encourage uh, us to, you know, live by our own hearts and, and follow our own path. And that was always the advice that I was given. And despite perhaps recommendations that, they wanted me to do other things, maybe wanted me to study longer, take up certain vocations or jobs. Um, even despite not wanting to do them, they never kind of stopped me and they never kind of held me back, even if they may not have disagreed with, um, you know, the path that I was going down. And 
I can imagine them being here now probably laughing at that <laughs> statement because they probably feel, still think that now to some degree. So they, they actually really encouraged me to, to always, you know, kind of follow my heart and, and do what I felt was right, despite what other people, um, you know, would say was right for me. So um, I grew up with that and um, I think that was really encouraged in me. And um, I, I feel that was a really kind of positive um, attitude that they ingrained in me from, from a young age. And it's certainly something that, if I ever have children myself, I don't have children, but if I ever do, then I'll definitely take that on. And because uh, you get a lot of parents that they, they want the child to kind of live their lives, their version of lives, perhaps things that they didn't do in their, you know, childhood or adulthood. And, you know, they tr tend to want the child to live out their dreams. And um, I think that can be a dangerous trap. And, uh, that was, I was always encouraged the opposite and uh, I'm, I'm very grateful for that from them both actually. So yeah, I would say that. Nice. What book has been most influential on your life and why? Um, so this was a difficult one. When I was sitting down, this was the question I had to keep coming back to. Um, but I would say a book that really opened my eyes is a book that's actually been banned and, you know, well, you can still actually get it on PDF, but it's been taken off all kind of mainstream sites. But, and, and when it was available, it was insanely expensive, which is the other um, indicator that they don't want you to read it. Um, there was a book called uh, The End of All Evil by Jeremy Locke. And it basically talks about how a lot of, constructs that we've accepted in society um, are at their root actually based in evil so when you look at authority um, we have government and uh, you know these men and women in dark suits telling us how to live our lives what to do um, you know when you look at something like taxation how it's forced upon us and if we don't pay it, we're kind of thrown into a cage or beaten up by people in, uh, in fancy dress costumes. And um, so how all, this, all this, this, this dynamic of authority, government, politicians, how, you know, force is, has been accepted through the things that they dictate, how actually all of this is, is based in evil because, um, you know, the, tr the truth is that, no man or woman has a right to rule over us or tell us how to live our lives. Um, all man-made laws really, are, they don't exist anywhere in nature. They, they're just, they've just been invented by men and women in dark suits and they're enforced by force um, or imprisonment. And um, so at the time I was just coming to these certain understandings because you just grow up with government. You just grow up um, never you know, never questioning authority, like from cradle to grave, like, you know, that can be through teachers at school or parents, you know, we're punished, we're punished if we, if we question authority. And so I'd never really pondered on that, um, you know, those things in my life, it was just something that, you know, you just grow up to accept. And it's just part of the nature of, of how we exist here that, that government is this all empowering entity that we just have to obey and adhere to. And, and that's it. Right. <laughs> um, but that book really goes into how, you know, it, it is all actually just based in evil and um, really opened my eyes up to a, a lot of the deceptions that we've just accepted and, and really how these times that we're living in um, we're seeing um you know, kind of evil in its death throes. A lot of people are really starting to kind of wake up to these facts that, you know, government is uh, basically just an illusion of choice. You know, there is no choice, choice per se. It's, you know, you have the Democrats and Republicans where you are um, in the UK, it's Labour conservative. So these are basically two wings of the same bird. And uh, basically nothing ever changes when you, vote either of them in it's just the, the same things continue so what we actually have is an illusion of choice not actually choice right. itself and so we're living in like a massive perception deception and 
um you know we have these people telling us they're going to do one thing and they they always go back on their their word um and they need to keep us in this this uh kind of amnesic state and hype it up and you know when you look at especially in america all the time on the television the politicians are telling you how free you are right <laughs> and uh it's almost like if you're that free why do you have to keep telling it and and actually repetition is a form of hypnosis right so you know they repeat these uh you know mantras over and over again to get the the general populace to to believe it and um the truth is is that we're not entirely free at all and we're actually um living in a world of basically enslavement enslavement comes in different forms but we're actually debt slaves people think of enslavement and they think ball and chain but you know our our balls and ball and chains are our credit cards our de- our debit cards our loans our mortgages and um so we're in this perpetual cycle of paying uh interest on really something that doesn't exist when you look at money it's like we're the only species that <laughs> pays to live right <laughs> so you don't see like um, animals or birds you know paying mortgages to build their nests and you know we we've we've bought into all these weird things that really don't have any place in nature and um, so that book really just goes into all those dynamics that we've we've been caught up in and really opened my eyes to a lot of things that I'd never thought about how did you get exposed to the book um it's actually on you can get it on pdf um but it was um i was actually exposed to it by a guy called mark passio he does um he's got a youtube channel and and podcast and and he talks about this kind of stuff and and he recommended it but when i looked it up this was about 4 years ago it was about it was about 60 dollars i can't remember if it was on amazon um but it's not there anymore but you can get it on pdf there's a website that's got it got it on pdf so i recommend all your listeners to have a read it's a very short book it's not going to take up like months it's it's i think it's only even about like 70 or 80 pages. Oh wow. But it yeah, it's so hard hitting and it really just opens your eyes to you know the deceptive nature of of this reality that we're in. You said it was banned. Is it I mean, can we search for it and find a PDF easily or is that Yeah, I I, I, did, I had a quick search uh, earlier when I was doing the research for for the podcast and there was um there was a website where you can um download it. Okay. I can't remember but Maybe okay. I, I send maybe I can send that to you guys after the podcast and then you sure. can put it in your descriptions and and stuff. Absolutely. Yeah, I would like to share it with the community. I mean, when it, whenever anything is censored, I want to look into it because it's oh, yeah. information they're trying to keep from you. So, yeah, Well, you know, you awesome. know they you know they're banning uh, 1984. Oh yeah, it's 1984. Yeah, the, down in the schools here it's nowhere. It that's uh, been pulled out of a lot of curriculums. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, it's uh, it's crazy what's going on. This is modern day book burning. Hey, oh yeah, and that book changed my life. I've got a 1984 tattoo. When I was a teenager, I read that book and it it peeled, you know, the onion off the world for me. I was like, "Oh wow, yeah, I see where this is going." And then to kind of see yeah. it come to fruition, it was like, "Damn." Yeah. Yeah, to 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 be living in it right now is is a uh, is another level together. But that was good that you was exposed to that book so young. I mean, it was you know, nice to be shown not to be crazy when you're talking about the government listening to you, intercepting all communications, radio, been doing it, you know, starting in the 70s and people are like you're crazy. Then Snowden blows the lid off and it's like, "Oh no, yeah. it's even deeper than that." And then it's like I don't have tin foil on my head, okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the people that are telling you to uh T- telling you that you wear tin foil hats and now walking around in masks, spiders and hamzat suits. So, <laughs> yeah. So uh, some deep magic going on there. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, it's a great book and uh, if you can if you can get the PDF download, it, it's definitely worth it. Sweet. What daily habits or rituals do you have? Um, so I thought about this. I didn't You know, obviously there's the usual stuff looking after your body exercise blah 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 yada yada. Um but I thought well, what else do I do different that maybe other people might not do um or how do I view my day? Um the first thing I do do which maybe is a little bit different is uh, I I eat eggs but I don't eat them cooked. <laughs> I have uh, I have cold egg yolks. I I have about three or four cold egg yolks. 
Now, the reason I have them cold is because when you cook stuff, it loses a lot of its nutritional value. And that egg yolk has every nutrition, uh, prop nutritional property that you actually need, right? So, um, so I separate the whites from the, the yolk and I have three or four in the morning. So I guess that's, I guess that's one of my weird rituals. How do you, um, how do you source your eggs? Um, so basically here in Mexico, there's organic, oh, it's, very, it's yeah. very easy to get organic eggs. Um, not stacked on so, top of each other. That's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but basically cut a really long story short, I went down, I was vegan for four years and, um, I was, uh, I, I actually made myself ill. I won't go into it all, but you know, it, each to their own, but there, there is certain things about that diet that, you know, perhaps we're not fully aware of again with the, the, the manipulation of information and stuff. But so anyway, I, I turned, um, back and I'm, uh, you know, I've sorted out a lot of my problems, but the egg yolk thing is a real like life hack. And, um, you know, so if you, if you can, uh, if you can get into that, it's really good. And, and it just tastes really nice. You know, it just slides down. Everyone goes, well, isn't it a bit gross? But it just, it's just an egg yolk, but it's just cold. So, um, so that's uh, perhaps something I do every day that's a little different. And then I look at um, my whole purpose, I guess, in, in my life is to, to try and, and make a difference in the world. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, however that may be, you know, creating information, not, not creating information, creating podcasts, writing blogs, um, you know, researching um, and just raising awareness. You know, we're in a time right now where, um, you know, we, the lies are starting to come up. People are looking for, you know, alternative info or the truth, let's say. And so I guess uh, what I try and do each day, one of my habits is I just try and impact the world in my own way. And, um, you know, whether, the, like I say, whether that be creating a blog or a blog or, you know, just a Facebook post, just, just things that get people thinking maybe a little bit differently and just kind of, you know, encouraging people to, um, almost realize their own power and their own sovereignty because, um, we've been basically from cradle to grave taught that we're little me, we have no power. Um, you know, as I said before, we, we, we have to rely on government and without them, we can't function. And so just really trying to empower people. And, um, you know, if I can go to sleep at the end of the day and now I've done a little bit of that, then, then I'm happy. So, um, but then, yeah, I've, I've got all my other things, you know, I try and exercise daily and, you know, eat well and, and all that stuff. But I guess they're the, 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 the other things that I habitually try and do. That's awesome. Cause you know, when the right bad idea or negative thought catches, it can catch like wildfire when it, it hits the right dynamic situation. Same thing for good ideas, positive thoughts. You don't know where it came from. It could be a convergence of multiple people, but yeah, that makes a difference in the world. You, you could spark a, you know, a, a mind change and, um, that's yeah, beautiful, man. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and it's not always necessarily positive. It's, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of the things I've already spoken about on the, on this podcast, you know, in regards to that book and what it talks about, it's not, not necessarily positive. It's, it doesn't make you go all gooey inside. But you said it, it right. It's changed somebody's mindset because everybody falls into ruts, whether it's, you know, neuro linguistics, you know, neural pathways in your body, ways of thought. And when you, it's like a comedian, when he jumps you out of that train of thought and you're like, oh, I never thought yeah. that way. Now you're in a whole different, you've, you've, you've opened a new room to your box. Exactly. Yeah. I, my job is I, I, I try and get the gray matter going, you know, and sometimes it's positive. Sometimes it's, well, you know, it's not so positive, but it, I don't think any knowledge is negative. Um, you know, as long as it's based in truth, uh, uh, what we're seeing right now is like an information war. And so you've got information on top of information, on mm -hmm. top of disinformation, on top of more disinformation and then somewhere in in all of that there is the truth so what what people and you know what what i try and do is encourage discernment as well because um we've kind of lost um our ability to, to discern you know we, we just i mean you've got 
most people that just take what the mainstream media say on face value. And then you've got all these layers of, of disinformation and agendas for, you know, other people that, that are kind of o- overlaying that. So it's almost like, a, yeah, a bit of a minefield. So really, um, really discerning. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, how does the information feel? Like not in the sense of, does it make me feel good? Because the truth doesn't always make us feel good. But, you know, is there that, I, I say that truth has a resonance. There's, there's yeah. like, that's why people say, oh, that really resonates with me because that truth is a frequency. And so it's really getting to tune into that frequency to discern what's true and what's false. And um, yeah, just uh, bringing that, bringing that to the table and um yeah, just just letting people discern it for themselves and make it in their own mind. But you know, as long as, as long as people are thinking and they're questioning what they're being told, questioning the media, especially with what's going on now with all the you know madness, um, then you know I feel like that's that's my job done, really. If I were to ask your best friend, what is the one thing they would say you need to work on the most, and why? <laughs> Yeah, this is the other one. I wrote down all the all the questions. I, I wrote down the answers that I knew straight away. This is one of the ones that stumped me on. <laughs> um, I had to really think about it. Well, but. to be fair, you know, you're not your best friend, so it's a hypothetical. No. Yeah, but it's, it's, exactly. it's, it's also pretty self-reflective. It's like, ooh. Yeah, it really was. That's why, that's why I really liked, uh, you know, when you, when you approached me, those questions were really getting me to think. So um, I, would, I would say that some of them, might take might tell me to to tone it down a bit <laughs> um in the fact that you know i can be quite outspoken about things and i think sometimes maybe the way i can deliver information can be see i'm i, I feel like i'm not someone like everyone has their thing and um some people are very good at kind of like molly coddling people and you know being very gentle and nice and uh, about how their information Whereas I'm a little bit like um, more hard hitting, like I'm like the mate that, you know, we all have one where they'll tell you what you don't want to hear, but in the end, you might not like to hear it, but in the end, you're glad that they did. And um, I think sometimes, you know, maybe maybe I could take that a little bit too far, depending on the mood that I'm in. And maybe it's quite interesting. My my surname is Sayers. And people say, do you do you think your your surname's like some kind of um, you know universal thing to you know because that's what I do. I just say what what I see a lot of the time, and I, I don't really have filters. So maybe they would say, uh, Tony, you might need to tone that down a little bit. And uh, maybe I do in certain um, certain times. You know, there could be uh, something to that. I know that with names, you know, if you have a last name of Crooks, you're you know, statistically more likely to have a criminal record. And there's these other little things that go wrong and you go along with it. And it's like, you know, is it society pressuring you? Is it something built into the fabric of reality? Is it your, your mind having it in there? So it it drifts that direction. Nobody knows, but it's there. So maybe it it could, it could be something. Yeah. It's really weird. It's uh, yeah. Some people have said it maybe it's synchromystical, but um, really brings naming your kids to a different level too. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't think I look at my name and say, "Oh, I'm going to be really outspoken." It's just, mm-hmm. you know, it's just the way I, I, I am. Um, but yeah, maybe there's something in that subconsciously. Um, so yeah, maybe I think sometimes it's say maybe you went a little bit too far there, and um, you know, maybe you could have presented that a little bit in a softer way, maybe, but. You know, it's, I don't know, I just put it out there and let the cards fall where they may. Nice. And, um, you know, but that's what I, that's what I think. But I, I think I need to um, find out from them. <laughs> what are you most curious about? Oh my God, everything. Like, I'm, I'm just curious about everything. Why are we here? What is our purpose? You know, why are there... Why are there people that are rich? Why are people just living in poverty? Why do we have war? You know, where does that come from? Um, I, I'm, I'm curious about everything, 
ev absolutely everything that the nature of, of males the, the 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 true nature of females that's that's a rabbit hole that i'm in at the moment because there's been a lot of distortion and you know social conditioning around that um yeah i i i don't know it's um i've i've always um i say always it was there was a time where i wasn't really that engaged i was just plodding along in life and um you know working the nine to five and really the last 10 years i would say that it, I, i've really just i wanted to know everything because around 10 years ago that's when i quite unquote had my my awakening which actually came through boredom because i was doing this nine to five job and um, felt very bored and unsatisfied and um it, i remember standing in my kitchen at the time i think i'd had an argument with my boss and uh, it was about eight o'clock i'd got come home really late and I just remember looking up, like rolling my eyes, thinking, my God, is this going to be my life for the rest of, of my days, working this, you know, nine to five, well, it wasn't even that, like nine till eight, you know, getting grief, you know, not feeling fulfilled. And I remember thinking to myself, that I must have a higher purpose than this. This is, this is just going to drive me crazy. And it was from there that, you know, I just started, you know, stumbling across information that opened my mind and, and then it, it kind of starts that that fire within you because once it's lit, you want you that's it. You want to you want to know everything then, and then you start finding out about the deception and you know the nature of reality and all this stuff and the things that you're not taught at school and and just everything opens up. Your whole world opens up, which is why they want to keep people in that that kind of uh, mental box, you know, and these rigid belief systems, so you don't open yourself up to, um, I don't know, higher streams of consciousness or higher thought forms. And um, so, yeah, I would say absolutely everything I'm interested in. Yeah, everything. <laughs> if that's an answer. No, it's a beautiful answer. I I absolutely love it. Yeah, because when people start going down those uh, those rabbit holes, those seeing whatever it is, when you start exploring the things that are are withheld, they mm. resonate in a way in a in a way that you understand better than the real world. And once that happens, it doesn't matter. It's 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 an if it's not the truth, you feel a connection to something. It's mirroring something there. So yeah, 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 absolutely. And I think we all. We all had, I mean, you, by the sounds of it, you were exposed quite young to, to this, you know, alternative information and stuff. But for me, it was 30, I was 33 years old when I really started to question. But I always, now I look back, I always felt there was something more like we, we weren't being told everything, I did, you know. So it, it, that nagging feeling, you know, it, mm -hmm. it, it sort of, it drove me, I think, into, into searching, so. What was the most embarrassing or humbling experience of your life? Uh, for me, um, I'm a huge traveler. Um, I travel, travel has been my passion since I was 21 when I first got around the world ticket. I'm very, very blessed to have traveled so much and um, very, very thankful. I've been to some amazing places, met beautiful people, um, seen so many different cultures. You know, I lived in Asia for you know, a good three or four years, I've lived in Australia, I'm now in Mexico, I've traveled all over Europe. And the most humbling experience for me is when you go to these poor countries and you realize that the people with nothing are, of, uh, are, are always the most friendliest, the most generous, the most giving. And it really makes you reflect on your own societal conditioning and how we live in the West. Um, and to give you a more exact example of this, um, there was this, um, I lived in Cambodia for a couple of years. And when I got, Cambodia is like one of the poorest places I've, I've been to. And when I got there, I was like, right, I want, I'm here, I want to contribute. It's, you know, I've, I want to be able to, I'm living here, I want to give something back. So I had this kind of intention. And then one night I was out um and it was like this market i got ch chatting to this canadian woman and i was just saying yeah i'd really like to help and she's like oh it's funny you mentioned this because um i'm actually working with this um this cambodian guy at the moment and um he's in quite a bit of spot of bother 
and I, and so she told me the story. The story goes basically this this guy um, basically when he was young, uh, his parents were killed by the Khmer Rouge regime. So he was um, abandoned and he was orphaned. And he um, at that time he con he contacted uh, so he contracted polio and he lost both of his legs. And so um, kindly enough, um, some Buddhist monks took him on and he stayed at the monastery for quite a few years. And then um, he got to the age where he decided he wanted to go and get married and, and have some children. And um, so he left, um, bearing in mind he's, this is a guy that walks on his hands. And um, he met someone, he met a woman, and he had two children. And the amazing thing about this guy was, he, even though he was extremely disabled, that, you know, that wheelchairs non-existent, you know, it, it, they don't have money to buy wheelchairs. They're walking around on their hands if they're disabled. And so um, he decided that um, he didn't want his children to grow up seeing him as a victim and a, a victim mentality. It would be the, the easiest option for him would have been to beg, but he didn't want to see his children beg. And so what he did was he started um, making jewellery um, out of different stones and rocks and things. And um, he used to go along, walk along the beach, the tourist beach, um, on his hands and sell these uh, pieces of jewellery to tourists. And so that's what he did. And he did this for year upon year upon year, not making a, a great deal of money. And to the point where... Um, in the end, he started getting arthritis in his arms and to the point where he could no longer walk, walk on his arms. So, you know, he's, his wife was also a little bit mentally disabled. She couldn't work. work, work. So um, anyway, this Canadian woman found out about him and she said, Tony, you know, he's, um, he, he's, not, he's not earning any money now. He's basically he's living in a shack by the river where basically the sewage flows and it's flo flooding into his home and there's snakes in his home, you know, from the flooding. Um, and, uh, you know, his children can't, he can't afford to put his children into school. And um, do you want to come on and, and have a look where he lives and see what you can do and see if you want to get involved? So I went the next morning and uh, I've never, I've never seen anything like it. I mean, to say it was a squalor is a, is a, a massive understatement. I mean, it was just like a, a rickety old shed on stilts. Um, he had his two kids in there and his wife, and um, yeah, just you know, it, it, you could see where this water of the river had come in and flooded it, and the wood was damp and rotting, and just and so. I couldn't believe that this guy was just trying to support his family like that. And, um, of course I wanted to, to help him. So me and this woman set up a GoFundMe and the intention was to, um, uh, buy him a disabled motorbike so he could get down to the beach and sell it from there and make a ramp on his, um, home, do some repair work on his home, um, and put his children into school. And um, so basically I filmed this. It's still on my YouTube channel, actually. And um, long story short, we managed to raise the funds, more than enough funds for him to, uh, to do all this. And we put his children in school. We also paid for them to have English lessons. And um, so we really helped him out. But the, but the, point, the point is that I was so humbled by his story and, and the fact that my God, there's people in the world that live like this and, you know, how lucky are, are we, you know, in the West and um, just the courage and, and the determination and the strength of character that he had and the, the example that he wanted to set to his ch children um, was the most humbling thing that I've ever come across in my life. So That's beautiful. Please send us the, uh, the link to that. Yeah, I will uh, attach that. For sure. What is your greatest fear? How did you overcome it if you have? Um, okay, so my greatest fear is not living my full potential. Um, 
that scares me more than anything because I feel like we all have a purpose here in life. Our purpose isn't just to live a nine to five matrix life. And, and once I found that out that, you know, my life meant more than that, I, I, I wanted to make sure that I lived my full potential. So that to me means expressing my authentic self, speaking my truth, uh, standing up for what's right. And the way I want to make sure, the way that I make sure that I do that is I do a technique where I imagine myself on, on my deathbed, right? And I'm looking back on my life and I'm asking myself, did you have any regrets? I mean, I know we all have regrets, right? You know, no one's perfect, but did you do those things that you said that you wanted to do? Did you speak up? Did you speak your truth? Were you authentic? And did you help um, people when you could? And did you make an impact? Did, you, did your life mean something? Did it make the world a tiny little bit of a better place than before you came here? And um, I, I, if I can imagine myself and, and I'm getting, yeah, you, you did all that, then I know that I'm doing, I'm on the right path. Um, so, yeah, for me, it's not, yeah, not heights or sharks or anything like that. It's, I just want to make sure that uh, I kind of leave everything out there on the playing field, basically. Yeah, that's that's pretty noble, in my opinion. I think that people that that are speaking truth, and I think it's important to stress truth there. That you know, it's important for us to step up, especially you know, in the predicament the world is right now, and, and do that. And yeah. I, I, kept, I caught your live stream the other day. You were uh, talking about being shadow banned on the on some social media platforms. So yeah. I think you know, podcasts are probably the last you know uh, hope for free speech you know, the, the new frontier or whatever. So I'm glad that, you know, we're able to have you on and we can have this discussion. It's the only place yeah. to get your real news. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You, you're not going to get it on CNN or BBC. That's for sure. <laughs> what quality do you most admire in a man and why? Uh, courage. That was a very easy one for me. Um, I think, uh, I think ma masculine energy, um, it should embody courage. I mean, when you look at, um, you know, our ancestors, you know, how they were when tyranny was being raged, they would, they would stand up against it. They would resist it. And, um, I, I feel like that's the full embodiment. I mean, you know, that's masculine energy is about mission, purpose, drive, um, logic, reason. Um, but for me, courage, is is the underlying thing there from in a man that I you know that I respect and um, I acknowledge basically and I think um, I mean well we could go into this other topic but there's been a lot of um, feminization of men through um, well chemicals in the, the food and even alcohol you've got estrogen and and all this stuff and then you've got the kind of mental conditioning, social conditioning where, you know, men are kind of rep represent or presented as like bumbling fools and, you know, and that kind of stuff. And um, I think that that's been uh, done by design because um, if you can, uh, if you can feminize men, then society is a lot easier to control. And uh, that's part of what my work is uh, around or centered around at the moment. Something I'm really passionate about is just, you know, just reminding men of, of, of who we are, who we really are and who, what our true essence is and, and starting to embody that again. And because we all have that man within us, um, it's just, it's been beaten out of us through uh, different, different things over the years. And, and obviously it's happened to women as well because they've been emasculated with two waves of, of feminism um, and all the social, social conditioning that they've been uh, subject to. But um, yeah, so both sexes have had a job done on them. And um, yeah, so for me, uh, it's, it's definitely courage in a man. Who were or are your role models and why? Um, 
So I guess um, for me, the person that really started getting me thinking differently was David Icke. Um, he's, I mean, I watched four, uh, I watched a half an hour video of him and he literally changed my worldview. This is at the time when I was bored with my job <laughs> uh, that I was talking about earlier. And I just stumbled across him on YouTube. He's banned from YouTube now, of course. And um, it was it, the video. I still remember the title was uh, uh, David Icke. Was he right? And I thought, well, who's David Icke and right about what? <laughs> and um, so I watched this video and my whole worldview changed uh, within half an hour. And so that started things for me. And even to this day, you know, he's um, he's very articulate and I don't always agree with everything he says, but, you know, most of the time what he talks about resonates with me. And he really inspired me with that, you know, caring about what people think. You know, he got me out of that kind of mental schism. Um, so I'll always um, have a lot of time and respect for him and anyone else really that, that, that kind of speaks out against the system. There's a guy called Bill Cooper. I don't know if you know him, mm -hmm. you guys. Yeah, you do. Yeah. I mean, he's, he actually lost his life and he was talking about the stuff, a lot of the stuff that David Icke talks about, um, maybe even before David Icke. And, um, yeah, so, uh, people like him, people that have lost their life, um, you know, doing speaking out against, um, the wrong, the wrongdoings of this world and um yeah but but those two kind of sprung to mind really when when i kind of pondered on that question what institution of society or structural aspect of modern life would you change given the chance <laughs> i put down here everything <laughs> That's actually a really good answer because it's hard to define one and there's a lot wrong. It, 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 yeah. it, it, everything has like splash damage. If it was down to me, I'd pull it all down and start all over again. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, pe people might argue, yeah, but we need government and all that stuff. And there'll be, there would be chaos. Well, I mean, look at the world. There's already chaos. You know, it can't get much more chaotic than it already is. But I think, um, it, you know, if we're talking in like ideals. Uh, it, would all, it would all depend on the level of consciousness that we're at as a species. You know, obviously at the moment <laughs> we're, we're not quite there. Um, but you would, you would like to think that, you know, to, to start over again, maybe living much more in harmony with nature, um, you know, maybe using technology because it's not altogether bad. I mean, you know, look at this, we're, we're all connecting now. I'm in Mexico, you guys are in the, uh, the US and we're having this really great discussion, um, but perhaps um, maybe not using it in the, the more negative aspects that we do. Well, yeah, because it's like, what are the consequences of the technology's creation? You know, what happens to it? What does it do to the environment? What are the social consequences? If we could engineer our mindset so that the value was in the environment, not cutting down the tree, you know, yeah. there's, there's little value on living vibrant pieces of the environment, but when you chop them, kill them, grind them up, they have value. And I, I think about this a lot because it's, I don't think money's the root of all evil, but it's the mindset of which it, it transfers that energy of, because money is just this madness. It's, yeah. a, it's a psychological agreement. You and I agree on its value, therefore it is. So if we can find a yeah. way that the environment becomes the value, then I go, yeah, it's not making the cheapest soap. You know, yeah. it's about making the most biodegradable, you know, environmentally friendly product, regardless of the price. Yeah. Bio-based plastics that are renewable exist, but they cost too much. Okay, well, hold on. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, I love that. That's a, that's a, you got me thinking good. I like it. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the first thing I'd pull down would be the, the belief in authority and, and that others have the right to rule. I mean, that would be the, the very first thing that I would pull down because it, it's all built on top of that. Um, and, uh, you know, that just breeds more power, hungry people and, yeah, corruption and, and all that other stuff. So if we can get our heads around the fact that we're sovereign beings and that we've been sold this line that <laughs> authority is actually something that is tangible and real um, and, and is actually exists, 
um, then then you know we, we can move on as a species. So, but yeah, I, I would pull it all down and start all over again. <laughs> well, you said it right before. You know, it's got to be something collective. You yes. know, if it's if it's not a collective thing, it's not going to work. But you know, the science with like hundredth monkey syndrome, you know, and you know, morphic resonance and crystal creation gives me hope that you know, ultimately, you know, we, we can't be pulled off the path. The environment kind of is, not that we're destined to it, but we're predisposed to follow the positive path. Yes. Yes. Let's hope so for sure. Well, if we can't hope then, you know, what are we doing here? Well, exactly. Exactly. There's always hope. <laughs> what is the most courageous thing you have ever done in your life or you have seen? <sighs> this is a... Uh... <laughs> This is quite a funny one to talk about. Well, there's two really, but um, was it embarrassing thing? What was it? What was the question? The cor courageous. Yeah, what is the most courageous? courageous? Oh, right. Okay, yes. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> well, there's two really. Um, so the, the first one, I guess, was only a few months ago. And uh, basically, um, you know about all the paedophilia going on within the British royal family and Prince Andrew and all that, right? Oh, well, yeah. It's been uh, widely suppressed in America. Yeah, absolutely. So um, anyway, I, I was in London and um, I went to sort out my Mexican visa. And I thought, well, on the way back, I'm going to walk past, I'm going to walk through Green Park and, and just go by Buckingham Palace and see the masses worshipping, you know, these paedophiles outside the, their house and um, and that kind of thing. And so, anyway, as I was approaching, I saw these crowds and, and, and I saw, like, this golden carriage and I just got, it was like a force took over me. It was like I just had to walk over there and, and say something, right? So I went up to the gates of Buckingham Palace and I wish, I wish, that this someone was there that, to film it, but this really did happen. Maybe, maybe there was. It's in a it's in a database yeah. inside of the yeah. the house. I'm probably in some kind of CCTV somewhere. But um, so anyway, I was raging, and like sometimes this force just comes over me, and I can't like it, 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 I can't even stop it. It, it just uh, empowers me uh, or overpowers me. And so there's this group of tourists there. <laughs> And uh, they're all taking photos and the policeman there is chatting to them. And, and so I confront the policeman straight away. And I'm like, you do realize that you're outside protecting pedophiles, right? And he says, and, it, and he, I caught his tongue because he, cause this is right at the time when all the Princess Andrew stuff has come, Prince Andrew stuff's coming out, right? Like imagine all those, pro, the Panorama program, everything was coming out. And um and he was like, uh, 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 yeah, well, you know, that's your opinion. I, I was like, no, it's pretty much well known now. Like, this, it's even on mainstream TV. And he was like, yeah, well, I'm, I'm just doing my job. And I was like, well, how do you feel about just doing your job, you know, standing in front of a, a, pa a palace where they they don't pay any tax? I just went for it. And then, and he, he just kind of couldn't really answer me. And uh, all these tourists were just standing, staring at me like mouth mouse like a gar like that and um anyway i just i just i just walked off and I, when i walked off i was just like i just shouted out my lap the loudest i was just like fucking pedophiles <laughs> and, and, and i i got into the park and at this point i was in st james's park because green park kind of goes into st james's park and i just i, I just strolled out i just strolled out like I don't know. I, it just, I wasn't scared. I wasn't worried that anyone was going to arrest me. I, I, I just don't know what it was. It, it, this thing has come over me a couple of times. And so I walked out and, and these stories are looking back at me. And um, so I reckon that was pretty courageous. Uh, That's amazing. It, but this is going to sound crazy because this almost seems like the, not divine, but like there's something else that's getting channeled. Like it's, you know, because when you're telling that story, I'm thinking if I see that and I see the officer not being able to answer, the people yeah. who are here literally just to look at this place now are going, wait a second. So now that guy, he knows. And yeah. what's up with this guy? And now yeah. we, and so, but that, yeah. I mean, it's those cascading things that, because if you were there, I mean, if I was there or situations like this where your mindset gets flipped, 
by the crazy guy. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, he's not. Oh, those are the beautiful yeah. moments because it opens up. Well, if I thought this was crazy, this was crazy. And that guy was crazy. Maybe I should yeah. listen to more because there might be yeah. a few doors I need to open. Yeah, yeah, That's absolutely. Awesome. Yeah, I, I can only describe it as, as it's almost like I get taken over by something um, in that moment. And it's only happened. It's when I see really, really, really evil injustice like that. You know, when I saw that, it triggered me because obviously, you know, where kids are concerned, you know, and they're being abused and stuff. And then people are worshipping the abusers. It's something just went off and I couldn't control it. And I just had to, I had to. That's so truth. cool. Cause you hear this. I'm not, I don't want to, you know, uh, use the, the label hero, but you mm. hear this with people who are labeled heroes who never say they're a hero where they yeah. just said, I just knew what I had to do. Were you scared? I, I just, no, I, I just, I had yeah. to do what I had to do. I, there's no other answer. It's like, almost like the situation it's, when you said destiny, it's like, what were you born to do? Well, there's the situations where you have a knowing you, you, it's like you to go Neo. It's like, you know, the, the situation so well that you can just walk in and you know, you're going to navigate it. Right. You yeah. don't know where you're navigating to, but you know, you're navigating it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, that's the first actually actual time I've spoken Sweet. about it publicly because yeah, it's, uh, I don't know. It, it, you don't want to sort of blow your own trumpet or anything, but it was, it was, uh, it was, you know, it was pretty ballsy if I don't say so myself, but, um, but that's only like that. It's only ever happened once. And, and so one other time and the other time I'll tell you quickly as well, because similar thing happened. So in my hometown in Essex, South end on sea, I was walking through town, um, the, the town center, and I saw a military recruitment day, right? And obviously the things that military and war and all that, I, I'm so against that. And what they were doing was they were recruiting young kids, basically, uh, like teenagers. Same thing happened. My, my, flip, my lid flipped and this energy just took over me, right? So the place is crawling with soldiers, right? Obviously. There's, uh, there, there's about, I don't know, nine or 10 of them. And I'm on my own again. And, but, but my, my, my lids flipped and I've gone <laughs> and I've gone up to the, the I've gone up to, I've gone, how dare you try and recruit these kids into the, your war games, you know, all this kind of stuff. Like you're fighting wars for pedophiles and all this stuff. And like just gone off, like, you know, you're there for the oil. You're not there for, to liberate anyone you shouldn't even be there and they're all like these are like big like big big soldiers right and uh they're all they're all speechless again speechless and um come out with oh you know that's not that's nothing to do with us that's down to the government i was like well it doesn't matter because you know a, a, an immoral action is a, an immoral action no matter who tells you to do it and so i'm kind of <laughs> going into one here and uh you know they're, they're coming out with all the all the excuses or we're just following orders and all that stuff and and i was like you know you've got kids here you're recruiting into you know potentially them them dying and giving up their lives for these liars and parasites and same thing really uh, happened i just went in there and and just caused a scene and um the, the funny thing was right that Bearing in mind, there's about 10 soldiers. They turn around and say to me, one of them does, does he's like, um, if you don't leave, then we're going to call the police. And I'm like, yeah, but you're soldiers. <laughs> <laughs> like, and anyway, I just walked off. I walked off. But um, yeah, those, those are the most ballsy moments of my life. When I look back, um, yeah, they're, they're, they're moments that I would say, yeah, I was pretty... I was pretty much in my power in, in those moments. Well, you know those moments in your life when you flash back, you have that little deja vu or that similar situation, you think about like, oh my God, what was going on? Like, those are the kind of moments like, man, all maybe all you needed to do was just be there to put that that thought kicking back in somebody's mind, that that gear in the uh the 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 sprockets yeah. or just like, you know, gum it up. Yeah, I I, I don't know, but it, it's it's like I can't sometimes I just can't help myself and um those were the those were the two that stick out and hilarious but i was on my own on both occasions and I, nice. you know straight away after both of them i phoned my best mate i was like 
man, I wish you were here like to film it because I've just gone off my rocker. Like I just couldn't help it. And you should have been here to film it because it was funny. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, they, those were the, the two. What does it mean to be a man in today's world? Um, well, I think we kind of touched on it earlier. Um, I think pr- protecting the vulnerable, mm. um, the elderly, the children, you know, the, the women and, you know, just being that provider role, the action taker, um, the courage that I spoke about before. Um, I think to be authentic, to speak your truth, to speak your mind, you know, I think, I think that is also an expression of courage as well. And we've obviously, we've spoken about that as well, but all those kind of, yeah, everything that it, it, um, all those kind of masculine qualities that, that I mentioned before that have been lost through, you know, um, social conditioning and, and, and chemicals in the food and water and alcohol and stuff like that. Um, because, you know, you, you see it with sports fans, like they're very vocal and like if their best player gets sold or gets injured by the opposite team, they'll go ballistic, right? But when it comes to things that really matter, they, these, these men are silent. And so if we could get all those football fans and soccer fans in the UK, you, you guys call it, if we could get them to step into their power, then we really would be a force to be reckoned with. So. Um, it's it's where our as men our our attention of what we care about has, uh, I guess, been manipulated. You know, because sport is twenty four seven for for most men. Um, it's a nice distraction, but what they what we what we've done is we've channeled all yep. that energy of frustration and injustice out into into a football stadium, and so yeah, just getting back to what what really is important and what where our attention of care is. Well, hopefully we'll be able to take the reins and get ourselves under the control before nature, you know, takes the time to just recycle the system. For sure. And I think the more men that step back into that, that essence, then, um, you know, we, we, we're going to have a much stronger chance of doing that sooner rather than later. Yeah. And I, I would like to think that this podcast would help people and empower people to do that because you're right. The, the role models that we have, like sports figures, for instance, might not be the best mm. people to look up to and model your life after seeing as, you know, how they're caught up in this or that or whatever. But so, yeah, part of the show is encouraging people to go out and, and, and talk to their role models and ask them these questions yeah. and, you know, do some introspection and, you know, just better yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely needed. Well, Tony, that was the end of the uh, the first set of uh, questions here. Um, that was awesome. Uh, I know that uh, we got to keep you, so you got to uh, make your appointment there. Um, but uh, if you, yeah, we still got time. We still got time. Yeah. So if you if you will just jump right on in, you ready for uh, the bonus questions? Yeah, let's go for it. Sweet. All right. What quality do you most admire in a woman? Um. So. Again, we've, we've spoken about this. So where, where masculinity has been hijacked, also feminine, femininity has been hijacked mm-hmm. because, as I already said, they want to distort the, the sexes and confuse the sexes. So we have a society where men are frustrated with women and women are frustrated with men and uh, men aren't in their masculine, females aren't in their feminine. Um, so they've, had, they've really had uh, a lot of impact. I 
I know one not who when they know what It's one man rich and another man poor Why we ain't satisfied, why we gotta have more Why your suicide rates on the rest so high Why I tell you the truth but you say don't lie Why is being a good father at an all time low Why is it acceptable, yo, why I don't know Why she blame him and he blame her, it's useless Ask yourself this question, why you making excuses Why do parents gotta bury their kids Why we text and drive, not caring how scary it is why it's so hard to forgive and leave the past behind And if you did, then that's divine Why don't you help your brother when you see him fall Why do we act like God don't see it all Why do we call them black, them white, them Asians and use labels Now that's racism I don't wanna know why 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 Why is there innocent people locked up for life? While some people can't say nothing nice Why do we always got a question with all of the means? And why won't you follow your dreams? Tell me why The night when you took my dad Why'd you let me see my grandpa cry? And tell me why And why do you choose to hide Even though you was born to fly? And tell me why And why don't we turn from all the hate? And why don't we learn from all mistakes? Why do I keep This should be considered entertainment and not therapy. We hope you benefit from our resources available at 13questionspodcast.com. Thank you for listening.